Yes, then we start. Hello and warmly welcome everybody uh, to this webinar, which is organized by ACT Church of Sweden in cooperation with Development Pathways and hosted by socialprotection.org. My name is Gunnel Axelsson Nykander. I'm a policy advisor at ACT Church of Sweden. I will facilitate this discussion. Uh, ACT Church of Sweden is a faith and human rights based development organization working on international development, humanitarian response and advocacy, and a member of the ACT Alliance. Could we see um, the next slide, please? Yes, before we start, we have some housekeeping rules. Um, first, um, most important, that please put questions in the panel in the Q&A box and not in the chat. And there you can uh, direct your question to a specific speaker if you want. And there's also a possibility to respond to questions in writing. Uh, and there will be time in the end of the webinar for to respond to questions uh, live. Uh, before I present the speakers, I would just like to set the scene for the theme of this webinar, which is so-called social registries. Now, what is that? Social sounds nice. Uh, register sounds somewhat technical, perhaps complicated, even a bit boring uh, for many people who are engaged in social protection and social justice, I believe. Um, social registry seems to be a nitty gritty issue, which is really not so interesting. At least that is how I used to be thinking about this. Now, I found this is totally wrong. Uh, social registries are neither nice nor boring. In fact, they raise deeply political and ethical questions, apart from issues of economic efficiency and effectiveness. In order to illustrate why it is so important to discuss these uh, kind of registries, I find it useful to put it in one's own context. So during this seminar, please imagine that you and your family, uh, and your family's access to child grant, old age pension, free school lunches or other social services that you and your family benefit from in your own context that they were dependent on the kind of registries that we will discuss today. Um, so try to keep this in mind. Um, maybe this that I will say now is a spoiler, but I have a little story to tell you. Uh, at a small meeting a few years ago, Stephen Kidd and I, Stephen Kidd uh, presented the methodology of proximity tests and social registries for a group of persons from Swedish public agencies involved in international cooperation. They came from the pension agency, tax authority, Swedish social insurance agency, etc. And for them, legal certainty is fundamental and the correct provision of benefits that the citizens are entitled to is an absolute requirement and any errors should be followed up. Now, when they started to realize how these registers were constructed and that the degree of errors makes the targeting seem almost arbitrary. They were really in shock. So after this meeting, Stephen and I talked about their reaction and the fact that all those social registries is such an important vehicle for implementing poverty targeted programs, they are rarely debated or even noticed. So that's why we decided to make this report, which was published already last year. The report will be presented today, and we will also get a concrete example from the Philippines, as well as more insights on the proxy means tests and how they are linked to the social registers. Before I proceed to introduce the panel, we would like to know something about the knowledge of the among the participants in this webinar. So please respond to the following questions in the poll. And which and the question is: do you have any practical experience yourself of working with social registers. Uh, in case for some reason you cannot see the poll and not respond to it, please just um, write an answer in, in, uh, in the chat, like yes, no, or I don't know. And let's see 
if we get a response. Maybe we come back to that after uh, after a little while. You'll get time to to respond first. Now, next slide, please. And we can keep the uh, uh, the poll open for a while, I think. Um, our first speaker and main who will present uh, the report is Stephen Kidd, who is the main author. Uh, Stephen has for over three decades supported robust strategies and effective delivery in social development and social protection in low and middle income income countries in all regions. Uh, he set up development pathways more than 10 years ago and was before that leading DFID's social protection work, uh, working at HelpAge International, among other places. Uh, our next speaker is Emma Lindadap Kantal, and she is a PhD candidate at the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University of Rotterdam and a lecturer at Leiden University at the Hague campus. Uh, in her research, she's comparing the political economy of social protection in Cambodia and the Philippines with a particular emphasis on external donor influences shaping the social provisioning systems in these two countries. And the final speaker is Deloa Athias, and he's a senior economist at Development Pathways with research interest in public policy and development econ economics, especially working on quantitative analysis and has a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois. With that, I would like to welcome and um, let's have a look at the poll. Interesting. We have a very interesting audience here. I can see that almost, uh, almost half uh, have no experience, um, a little bit more than 10% really don't know. And as much as 40% do have uh, personal experience from working with these. So that I think sets the stage and it's very uh, interesting to, for, for a, a lively discussion after the presentations. But now please, uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Okay. Um... Thanks very much, uh, Gunnel, and uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening to, to everybody. I'll just share my screen. It's a pleasure to be here to be able to talk about the um, report that we um, produced last year on this, uh, as Gunnel says, important um, topic. It's, it's quite a long report, so I don't have that much time to, to get through it here, so I'll, I'll jump into it. Uh, a, a quick run through of some of the main issues and concerns that we highlighted in the in the report. So, I think that you, there's, there's many types of registries. A lot of them are great, right? Registries can be very, very good. Often, you know, we have management information systems where in, in social protection programs, which are used to manage the operational processes. You know, other countries have things like unique identification numbers that they're trying out to give to everybody, such as in India and Kenya. We can have a civil registry and vital statistics database, right? That's the one that holds the information on birth certificates, identity cards, and you know, ensuring everybody has identity. Uh, population registries, which are really just the database holding national census information. And then we have something called a single registry, which is in effect a a sort of monitoring mechanism that brings together information of existing social security programs that governments can use to see how effective their the broad system is using. So all of these registries have, have great uses and purposes and, and uh, uh, of, of, of very good for, for countries to have. Uh, but then we have the social registry as well, something that has been named in, in recent years with, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and has become very prominent. But what is the social registry? So the World Bank, uh, I think, are one of the main advocates of social registries. They would, you know, they, they define it as an information system that supports outreach, intake, registration, determination of potential eligibility for one or more social programs. Right, that's the broad definition, which, in simple terms, really means it's a low-cost, poverty-targeting database, usually using a proxy means test 
and it ranks households in a country from the poorest household to the richest after doing a, a survey of the of the national population. But they're sold having, been, having started originally just as proxy means tests to for targets and on one um, social security um, program, a poverty targeted program. So somebody realized well, we could use this for targeting everything. So it becomes this miracle database in that it said the countries having now got this database on their citizens can now use it to target a whole range of different services, which we've highlighted here, making it a very effective, apparently an efficient um, database to use for governments. And you have to say, well, gosh, if, you, if you've got all of that, why would anyone not want this? All right? It seems great. And uh, this is how it's presented. Well, one reason is the short answer. Why would you not want it is that they do not work. They're ineffective. And so what we want to try and show here is some of the evidence around why we believe that they're, they're, they're ineffective. Um, but social registries have, have spread across the globe. I think there's at least over 50 of them um, in low and middle income countries. You don't find them in high income countries. And you can think about why a high income country would not want such a thing as a social registry in its country. I mean, I think it would by the end probably cause a riot if that if it was used to to target um, um, uh, recipients of social security schemes in any high income country but we find them in low and middle income countries and here's a list of, of of most of the ones that we were able to find by the time that we'd written the 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 paper but one definition of a registry and uh, this is a, a blog written by a, a, a friend of ours um, uh, nick freeland it says, what is a registry? If you look at it in the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, it's an official authoritative book of records. So it's meant to be a registry of everything, right, in there. So if it's if a social registry is going to be effective, it's going to be a proper registry, it should cover the entire population, all households in a, in, in a country if it's trying to get the information. But as you can see here, most social registries cover a very tiny proportion of the of the population so in effect aren't really registries anyway because they only have a small number of people and there's only very few you can see the the top left hand corner that really have quite high national coverage so most social registries are really uh, misnamed they're not actually registries they're just a data and a small number of households within a, a, a particular country but one of the big problems with social registries is that they assume that household incomes and circumstances are constant, right? Which means that they, as a targeting mechanism, they cannot deal with shocks. Once you've done your initial survey and you've ranked households, you're stuck with that data. So if we look here at the simple diagram, we look at a say a household's income on the left, the higher up it is, the, the higher its income. And then we look over time as it moves through the, you know, the, the life cycle over time. Um, the social registry for the period of time that the data after it's collected is used, and that's often for a long time, to assume that the income and circumstances of the household does not change at all over time. However, we know from, you know, from uh, our own experiences and, and, and from, from uh, uh, lots of research and panel data sets, we know that actual household incomes go up and down like this as people take opportunities or they respond to or, or they're affected by, by shocks. So this idea of a static set of well-being over time is a complete um, fiction. The problem with this then, when we have a social registry, when we have these dynamic uh, changes in, uh, in, in income, is that if, for example, you were, if a social registry even worked well, and we see that they don't, but if they worked well, if you assessed a household at this point when it was doing better, then the social registry is, you know, assumes that the estimated income of that household, its ranking remains at this amount over time. You know, and perhaps the eligibility threshold for a program is, is down there where this orange line is. So this household will, not, will never be able to access the social security program because it's got this constant um, estimated income from the social registry. But as we've seen, Incomes go up and down, household well-being goes up and down. So the problem is if that household is affected by a shock at this point when it's and, and its income falls, it won't be able to receive any support from the program. And the reason for that is because the social registry continues to maintain the fiction 
that its income is up here. So that means social registries are not shock responsive. And a good social security system, that's what it should be, it should be shock responsive. And of course, risks and shocks are part of our everyday lives and social security systems need to be able to respond to them. I don't have time to go through the kind of risks that we could see here from early childhood to old age that many of us experience. We also have disability and chronic illness that can hit us at any time and covariate risks. And social registries are not able to respond in any way to these, these kind of risks. And in fact, another problem is that the information social registries, once it's collected, is almost immediately out of date, right? Almost immediately, household circumstances will have changed. So we looked at uh, um, a data set, a panel data set in Rwanda, just looked at one thing, household size, which is often used in a social registry when they're looking at perhaps 20, 30 different factors. There's only one factor, you know, and on the assumption that household size, you would have thought doesn't change very much. But when you look at this in the same households in Rwanda, over three years, and you look at the size of the household in 2010, 11, on the left, different sizes, and then you look where they were, the different size of these same households, three years later, you see a massive change. And in fact, over this period of three years, 87% of households in Rwanda um, are a different size, which means that a social registry that's not targeted for, retargeted for a year or two years is gonna be nonsensical. And in fact, if you look at the same um, households in in uh, in Rwanda, and you sort of rank them according to the proxies in the house in in the um, in the in the uh, proxy means test that's that would be used for the um, social registry in in uh, in Rwanda. You can see that well, we have the rankings on the left in 2010-11 of households. Just three years later, they again they've completely changed. There's a massive volatility just in the proxies, never mind the, in, the actual income, but just in the, in, in the proxies. And you have to question, what is the point in investing in a database in which the data is out of date almost immediately? It's a very little utility to you. And often we've seen in proxy means test, the data is not renewed for up to perhaps 10 years um, time. Sometimes it's three years, but often it's, it can be up to um, uh, 10 years before it's renewed as recently happened in in Pakistan, for example. And of course, the advocates of social registers will say, well, we've now figured out dynamic registration where households can register at any point in time. I don't have to get time to get into many of the problems with, with that, but actually let's not be fooled about that because even when you register, um, if you did dynamically and on demand into a social registry, then your data will still be maintained for a number of years as if you were constant but you would be assessed against other households that would have been registered at a different point in time, making the comparison even less meaningful. And the result of all of this, and there's many other things, and Delo will talk a bit more about it, is that social registries don't work. So when they're trying to target and rank households from poorest to richest in a, in a, in a country, you end up with very high levels of targeting error. And uh, you can see the the sort of, of a number of programs globally in low middle income countries that use social registries. These are the kind of exclusion errors that you find. So the best we found was 44% of the intended beneficiaries of Bolsa Familia um, were excluded. And that was the best performance, um, only 44% exclusion. But then in many programs, many of them well known, um, the errors, exclusion errors were much, much higher. And therefore this social registry looks very inaccurate, looks very arbitrary, and as a result can, in some cases, um, lead to large-scale social conflict. There's a paper written, written by a colleague of ours that recently showed, traced back the, 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 um, um, the Syrian co the conflict in Syria and found that it was a proxy means test, and a social registry that was put in place that helped generate the, um, the, the civil war in, in Syria about 12 years uh, um, uh, ago. So this, this, this can have serious consequ consequences in undermining trust and the national social contract. The other problem is that social registries, they can be used for perhaps household-based programs, but they can't be used for individual life cycle social security programs. So even if you have a means-tested individual life cycle scheme like a child benefit or an old age pension, 
Um, many people who have almost zero income may be excluded by the social registry because you may find, say, an older person who has no income because they're retired, they have no income, uh, so they're disabled, but maybe living in a household with their children who are better off and assessed by the social registry is better off. That older person who has no income um, will not be assessed against their own income, but against the household income, and therefore will not be able to access um, the, 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 say, an old, a targeted, poverty targeted old age pension. And that means they could remain in a situation of dependency, uh, perhaps um, uh, experience of mistreatment in the, in the household because they will not be able to access their own, their, their, their own income. And what we find in some countries is that often people in that situation may be encouraged to move out of the household so that they, they can then be assessed as if they were a separate household. And of course, with universal um, life cycle schemes, you can't use a social um, registry because many people are not on the on the registry. So you can't just go there and get a whole list of children. Just to give an example, there's a so social registry in northern Kenya linked to the Ho Hunger Safety Net program, which is fi financed by um, DFID, now the, the UK's uh, incorporated in the UK's Foreign Office. And um, a, a advisor in, in DFID asked the program um, you know, which had done its survey and done its registry in 2011. He asked them in, in 2016, he said, could you please tell us how many children are on the Hunger Safety Net program? Can you get that information from the registry? And of course, the program uh, that was managing the program to answer, well, no, we can't tell you anything. At the moment, we have no children on the registry aged 0 to 5 because we've not actually collected any data from 2011. It's all out of date. It's not being kept up. So the social registries don't collect data on children being born. Other households will have moved or people will have moved out of the household and some will have passed away. So you can't use it for a universal individual life cycle scheme either. Stephen, and, you might want to keep in mind that you have two more minutes. Yeah, that's fine. It should be just about all right. So the social registries, um, you know, well, I said they're cheap. They're cheap because they're not they're they're. Um, not done for many years, but then you won't go, you know, they can be quite expensive. So this is the cost that we found in terms of doing the survey per household. And you can see that the cheapest cost that was uh, reported was in Colombia, where it was up to about $2.50 per household, which seems quite um, cheap, up to $26 per household in Kenya, in Northern Kenya, which is, is very expensive. And so they can actually, on a one-off survey, be quite high cost. So when we found some data on overall costs in some countries that had quite large social registries, we found costs of between 60 million and 100 million dollars to do this. That's a lot of money for a lower middle income country to spend on a, on a database that has out of date data and gives an arbitrary result. And if you look at Tanzania, where it was $12 um, to do the social registry per household, if that was done nationally, that would have cost Tanzania $149 million, which I don't really think that a country like Tanzania could or should afford. But the report that reported this said $12 they found was a reasonable low cost for Tanzania to, to do this. So if you to look at the costs, you know, we extrapolated out in some countries, if you did a cost might be $5 a household or $10 a household, you can see in some countries, especially larger countries, we're talking potentially phenomenal amounts of money. Nigeria, the low, lowest cost there, $5, would, would require $250 million, $215 million to do it, going to potentially $430 million to do a proper social registry in a country like, uh, uh, quite a large country like Nigeria. So what happens then, because of these high costs, is that, as I said, they're not, re surveys aren't repeated for many years, or in fact, they, don't, they only go to a small restricted proportion of households, a small number that people are sort of guessing may be the poorest, which then increases the errors and means it's not a proper registry of, of households in the country. But finally, I think the, the, the main point I think is that a social registry, while the name sounds nice, it's actually embedded within a particular ideology and it's embedded within a poor relief model of, of, of so, social security. This kind of poor relief model here, if we look at the population for the poorest at the bottom to the top, where we have the big missing middle because we have poverty targeted programs for those at the bottom and social insurance 
um, for those at the top. And it's the social registry is trying to deal at the bottom with this group in this poor relief, almost 19th century model. Whereas what countries need to do is to build a more rights-based model of social security where everybody's able to access social security across the life cycle, either finance from social insurance or by citizens through their general, through general um, taxes. And this is the challenge. And social registries have really no place in this proper modern social security um, system. And just to show the consequences you know, of the examples of this, if we take a country that's really well known for its social registry, Pakistan, where they had um, on, uh, at, the, at the time of the survey where we got this data, the Benazir Income Support Program, which used the social registry there for, for targeting. And what we've done here in this graph is we've looked at actually the change in household consumption as a result of the, the Benazir Income Support Program in orange, but taking into account the taxes that people also pay to fund the, the program. And we've compared it with a universal life cycle system in Pakistan, one that might cost 3% of, of, of GDP. And we've looked at the change in consumption. So here at this green line shows where there is no change in consumption, right? It would be constant. Um, and you can see that around about the 70th percentile, that's where we get the line crossing, at least for the, the universal um, system. So those to the left, the 70% are net winners, when you take into account the benefit they receive and the taxes that they pay. And those- And I right would like you here. to wrap up very soon. Yeah, yeah, we're just in the second last slide. So this is the net losers to the, to, to the right, you can see here. And what we see on that is that the rich lose very little income with the Benazir Income Support Program, but the poor on the left gain also gain very little income. But with a universal program, uh, in Pakistan, the rich would lose much more because they pay higher taxes, which is why the rich tend to be opposed to universal schemes, while the poorest would be the big winners, and they would do much better, as would the vast majority. Now, this is a fundamental ideological difference between the two systems, which social registries embedded in this poor relief system that ultimately benefits the rich more than it benefits the, the poor. So just to finish off, I think, what countries have to do ultimately that are using social registries as the dominant means of identifying people in their countries is to choose, do they want to stay with this secondhand type of, imagine you're buying a car, secondhand lard, a sort of poor relief social security system, which we have these social registries, or I've called them in another paper, anti-social registries that don't function very well, or do countries want to choose and move to a modern life cycle social security system, a universal system, a Rolls Royce system that they may achieve in a few years, a uh, few decades time, if they're set off in the right direction, or perhaps in the meantime, they could at least get to a Toyota inclusive or universal social protection system. This is the big choice. And as far as I think we're concerned, social registries are very much within the larder poor relief model. So I'll just finish there and sorry for going over by a minute or so. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, you mentioned uh, dynamic inclusion, uh, and I've seen also in, in, the, in the chat this question coming up, uh, and, and you said that it's not a solution. Um, in the World Bank's new uh, strategic document, which was released uh, last week, the Social Protection and Jobs Compacts, uh, there is a discussion at some length on, on social registries and, and, and the, in fact the bank says that, well, yes, these registries were first developed as a tool to tackle chronic poverty and therefore they, they made sense uh, to identify the poor, um, to make this identification periodically rather than ongoing, but now they admit that this, uh, there's a lack of uh, dynamic uh, data collection. Uh, but there is some progress and they are looking at um, Colombia and, and uh, Pakistan as some examples. Now, what would be actually needed for a functioning dynamic inclusion, would you say? And please be sure. Well, I, th I think it's just, it's just way too complex for, for the purpose of just targeting poverty target programs. Dynamic inclusion, if, if you have a proxy means test, you have 20, 30, 40 different proxies. Right? Are you going to report every time one of your proxies changes? So perhaps you've said you've got two goats. A goat has a, another go uh, has a baby, but you've got three goats. Well, are you going to report that? 
because that's changed your circumstances. Our household's going to report all the time that, you know, if somebody's moved out or they've moved in, it's just, you know, very theoretical, not very practical at all. And you think if countries are really going to invest this kind of money, invest it in getting everybody a birth certificate and getting everybody an identity card, because that's your really important database. That's where you should put your money. And on that database, the vital, you know, your, your vital registry, then you can use that for identifying whoever you 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 want. So Pakistan, for example, has a another database, a very good database in which you're collecting um, where, where, which has identity, the identity of people. And that's a much more useful one. We just are investing in these social registries. And in many countries, so many children, so many people don't even have a birth certificate. Yeah. Okay, right, thank you. Priority. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll come back to that later, I'm sure. Uh, but now I will turn to Emma Cantal. Uh, please give us some evidence from how a social registry can, can work in practice with the, the example of the Philippines. The floor is yours. Okay, so can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, I think you can. In, yeah. Yeah right in that mood yeah right <laughs> well good afternoon from our side of the world and good morning good evening um wherever you are at, at the moment um my presentation today is um largely based on two papers that i co-authored with my uh, phd supervisors professor um, andrew fisher and dr charmaine uh, ramos and uh, one of the papers is actually uh, one of the resources for this uh, webinar, and I think you have a link. It's uh, it's uploaded on the, on the page for this uh, webinar, so it's open access, so you can check it. So first things first, um, I'd like to introduce to you our social registry in the Philippines. It is called Listahanan, a combination of two Filipino terms or words, lista, which means list, and tahanan, which means uh, home. Now. The Lista Hanan, on paper at least, is to be updated every four years. So, which means to say that if we had the Lista Hanan in 2009, it should have been updated in 2013. But, um, you know, there are challenges along the way, and I will discuss that later on. Um, so far, we have had three Lista Hanan cycles Lista Hanan 1, which happened in 2009 to 2010, Lista Hanan 2, in 2015 to 2016, and Lista Hanan 3, which is fairly recent actually, um, it, uh, it was started in 2019, finished in the last quarter of 2021, and was only officially launched um, in August this year. So um, I can only adequately discuss our experience of the social registry by also discussing the program that uses the social registry. Now in the country, the number one user of Lista Hanan is our conditional cash transfer program, which is called Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program or in short, Pantawid. Now, um, yeah, the, the, the Lista Hanan is closely associated with the Pantawid. It is the backbone, after all, of the um, beneficiary selection of the CCT program, which means to say that you cannot or you can only be a Pantawid household if, first and foremost, your household is identified as poor by the Listahanan. That's the number one uh, requirement. Also, the Listahanan uh, is uh, the reason or like cited as one of the reasons for the success of the Pantaweed. Now, speaking of success, <clears throat> the Pantaweed and Listahanan are, like we can call them as models or best practices. Um, I could not get into the details of this because I, I don't have enough time, but um, suffice to say that um, at the moment, Pantaweed is one of the best targeted programs in the world, thanks to the Listahanan. And with its more than 4.3 million household beneficiaries, it is also one of the largest CCT programs in the world. Um, so various assessments, for instance, highlighted, I mean, they highlighted many things, but like, you know, these are, these are some. So 
the, the program has reached, if not exceeded education and health related um, targets. It has high benefit incidence. Um, this benefit incidence is a standard measure on which to judge the program, whether it is pro poor or not. And um, I know that we've development pa uh, pathways find this benefit incidence problematic. We also find this benefit incidence problematic because a program that is already, that's in the first place targeted to the bottom 40% of the population should have near perfect, if not 100% benefit incidence, right? But for instance, an analysis in 2017 found that um, only 77% of Bantawid beneficiaries were from the bottom 40%, which actually implies high degree of um, targeting accuracies. But yeah, I, I won't get into details. And then of course, um, the Pantaweed and Listahanan supposedly fostered depolitization in the administration of social assistance through the, through the objective um, criteria and IT backed uh, targeting system. It helped, or these interventions helped minimize the um, intervention of uh, politicians in the administration of social assistance. And then, of course, uh, the, the Lisa Hanan and Pantawid also pro ha have promoted convergence. And what we mean here is actually administrative convergence, meaning there is better coordination now between programs and implementing agencies. And it starts with the use of this unified social registry, uh, this Lisa Hanan. So, um, so right here, um, you can see the um, household beneficiaries of Pantaweed from 2008 to 2020. Um, so um, all, all four presidents so far maintained the uh, Pantaweed, uh, Pantaweed program, but Presidents Arroyo and Aquino were the ones who really um, substantially expanded the number of beneficiaries in the Pantawi. So here, the first major expansion in Pantawi was in 2008. And so from the, from the pilot of just 6,000 households, uh, we increased the, the program beneficiaries to 283,000 in 2008. Now, Lista Hanan 1 was in 2009 to 2010. So it's almost two years because there were delays in the process. And based on the procedure or on paper, Lista Hanan 2 should have been um, done in 2013. So see Lista Hanan 2 plan. Lista Hanan 2 actually, uh, well, Lista Hanan 2 was done actually in 2015. To 2016. And the reason for the delay was that, according to the program, former program manager I interviewed, uh, there was, um, yeah, there was, a, they, the, the social welfare department of our country had uh, difficulty securing the budget for Lista Hanan II because there were members of the cabinet of the Aquino administration who were critical of the social registry based on the reports that they received of a um, high level of targeting inaccuracy. So it resulted in a long drawn out um, discussion between the social registry department and the other departments. And eventually when they got the, prog uh, the program, uh, Lisa Hanan budget, so they were only able to do it in 2015 and 2016. Now I'd like to draw your attention here, this one, these two numbers. So the, Pantaweed households peaked in 2014. I hope you can see my arrow. So it peaked in 2014. And based on the Pantaweed uh, reports that we reviewed, the, before 2020, the, the program's last expansion was only in 2015 here. So the, the bigger point here is that when, when the program peaked in 2014, and when the program last expanded, at least before 2020, those expansions were still based on Lista Hanan 1. 
listahan and one at the time was already at least five to six years old. So we 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 depended our um, expansion on an obsolete social registry. Now, in 2016, Duterte entered as the new president. So with the new president also came a new set of cabinet secretaries. Now, the new secretary of the social registry department, unfortunately, uh, imposed a moratorium on the Pantawid expansion. So why she did that? So I, I asked her during field work, and her reason was that the former administration of President Aquino supposedly reported that some 1.3 million Pantawid households already escaped poverty. However, when she entered the social, um, social, uh, social, social development uh, department, she found out that these 1.3 million households were still in the program and that the agency didn't have a clear plan on the transition of these families from the program. And so based on that, she imposed a moratorium on the Pantawid expansion, which in turn implies that Listahanan II was not used in the, in the selection of Pantawid beneficiaries beginning from 2016 to at least 2019. Now, despite the fact that the rationale of the moratorium was actually very good, it actually has very serious consequences on the beneficiary base of the Pantawi. And I would like to draw your attention again, again to these um, figures. So, like I said, the last expansion was in 2015, right here. And because of the moratorium, so there was basically very minimal movement in the number of household beneficiaries of the Pantawi, at least from 2015 to 2019. So the minimal movement here, if you know this, sorry, my, yeah, my arrow is acting up. So the minimal movement here is based on attrition. What is attrition? It's the exit of uh, beneficiaries from the program. Okay, for various reasons. Ideally, the reason should be that the, the, the beneficiaries are no longer poor, but that's not the case. The attrition here is, uh, the, the, the reasons for the attrition are, for instance, there are no more children who are eligible for the program. Uh, there was fraud discovered, um, inclusion error, or they could not locate anymore the beneficiary. So these, these things, no expansion, minimal attrition and assumed minimal replacement, which was still based in the least Han and one, actually caused a stasis in the beneficiary base. What do we mean by stasis? Meaning to say there that the beneficiary base was almost stagnant. It was not, there was no movement, there was no change. And so this stasis in the beneficiary base of Pantawid created a quasi-permanent group of cash recipients. So these cash recipients, I must repeat, were still based on the list of Han and one, which, for instance, in 2019 was already like 10 years old, very obsolete. Now you can see here that uh, the moratorium was lifted in 2019. <clears throat> um, however, I have to note that 2019, because list of Han and two was in 2015. 2019 is another Listahanan year, which means to say that Listahanan 3 should be started in 2019. And our government did um, start the preparation for Listahanan 3. So we can assume here that in 2019, the social welfare department already started to use the Listahanan 2 because the moratorium was lifted. But by this time, Listahanan 2 was already becoming obsolete. It was at least five years old. Now, the problem doesn't stop there because we know that, well, in the last months of 2019, well, up to this day even, we still have the pandemic. And in 2020, we imposed, the Philippines imposed one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. So as a response to the 
economic impact of the lockdowns due to the pandemic, the Philippine government uh, launched the social amelioration program. So it's right here. Now this, the SAP, that's what we call SAP. Now the SAP is composed of uh, 13 schemes that are um, intended for the different sectors uh, in Philippine society. And one of the biggest schemes is the so-called emergency subsidy program or the ESP. Um, so the ESP, it targets 17.9 million low income and vulnerable households. So, and because the Pantaweed are supposed to be the, the, the poorest households in the country, they were automatic beneficiaries of this emergency subsidy program. Now, here's, here's the issue there. This would have been an opportunity for the Listahanan to showcase its ability to, to identify vulnerability and to identify who the poor are. But based on our research and interviews with some um, field workers, beyond the Pantawi, the Listahanan was not useful at all. So, Meaning to say that the Listahanan was only useful for the Pantawid, uh, Pantawid households. And you have to remember at the time that a huge part of the Listahanan was still, uh, Pantawid households was still based on Listahanan 1. So, so Listahanan 2 was not very useful for the non-Pantawid households. So what happens then was that we went back to the time pre listahanan pre pantawid uh, situation so it repoliticized the administration of um, social assistance so we went back to the situation where um, identification of the poor and administration or the distribution of social assistance were actually in the hands of local government units that situation is supposed to be the situation to be addressed by the Listahanan and the Pantawi, but we went back to that. So what, what are the implications then of, of all of these, uh, all that I presented? So one, the, our case, the case study of the Listahanan um, highlights the perennial problems associated with poverty targeted, targeting, even in model social protection interventions such as the Philippines, Listahanan, and Pantawi. And in particular, um, I've given um, attention on the obsolescence of the social registry, which in turn um, is um, caused by delays in updating, administrative bottlenecks, politics, and even the weather. And I say even the weather because with, with respect to Listahanan 3, one of the causes for the delay of the completion is not just the pandemic, but also the typhoons that ravaged the country in 2020 and 2021. So further, this obsolescence implies, number one, stasis, at least for a time, 2016 to 2019, stasis in the beneficiary base of Pantawi, creating a quasi-permanent group of cash recipients. Second, partial coverage of target population resulting in real and perceived inequities within that population. And number three, the Pantawi and the Listahanan failed to provide protection to people who move in and out of poverty. So like we saw the, we saw the presentation of Stephen, how, how uh, economic situation of households can change overnight. So because of that obsolete, um, obsolete social registry, we fail to provide protection to people who are moving in and out of poverty. And with respect to the pandemic, the Listahanan has proven to be less useful at such a crucial time. And of course, all these problems um, are exacerbated by the policy idea of convergence, meaning to say the deployment of the Listahanan across programs and implementing agencies. So yeah, that ends my presentation. We can't hear you, Gunnell. So unprofessional. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
And, and you mentioned that Listahanan and Pantawid are sort of uh, identified as the, in, in the eye of people in, in the country as almost the same thing. They're really identified as part of each other. Uh, could you say something about, I mean, you, you explained to us a lot of problematic aspects here. Uh, among the public in the country, would you say what, what to, what kind of reputation or what's the attitude towards the, the, the system? And are these problems uh, about the targeting that you explained, uh, are they sort of well known? Well, the, the problems that I've explained are known to the, at the policy level, but um, I don't think it's scrutinized as much as we have scrutinized it. Like, the, the obsolete social registry has been recognized by no other than the World Bank and the ADB. I mean, you can read it and I can give you the links to those. <laughs> and that's how I like, you know, it, it really actually strengthened our, our, our findings here because they, they knew this all along, but then they still um, frame it as if it's, it's, it's less problematic. They still continue with the, with the rhetoric that you know, uh, social registry is good and that you, it's supposed to give them, um, how do you say that, like adaptive uh, capacity to the Pantawi to respond to shocks. I mean, it's, it's still the same rhetoric. And, and of course, that's understandable because we, they invested so much money in, in, in you know, institutionalizing these this interventions. Now, as to, the, as to the public, you are right. I mean, people are quite confused between the Listahan and, and, and the Pantawi. And uh, the, the, the social amelioration program actually um, heightened this negative um, attitude towards uh, Pantawi beneficiaries. So there was like more policing on them because when you say, um, when you say low income, what comes to their mind usually are the Pantawi because they're supposed to be the poorest you know, households in the country. So during the pandemic, because they were like the face of the uh, emergency subsidy program, even if actually there were, it was only 4.4 million Pantawid households, but the, 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 the program uh, targeted 17.9 uh, million. So, but then they were the face. So there was so much policing uh, on the attitudes of the Pantawid household. There was, yeah, there was so much uh, social, um, conflict, I should say, during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I would like to turn to uh, Dilua Athias, uh, who will give us some more depth into the methodology of poverty targeting that the social registers uh, rest on to a large extent. Uh, and the title of your presentation is Proxy Means, Means Test, Sealing Fate for Social Registries. Please, Tiloa, your the floor is yours. Thank you, Gana. So I think the host has to start my video if, if necessary. Yeah. Yes, we can see your screen. Sorry, one second. And now we can see you. Can you see the presentation still, Gana? We can see the presentation, but not in presentation mood. Yeah. Is it working out? Yeah, fine. So um, thank you. Thank you for this time and for the opportunity to present a little bit on the some of the findings we've, we've, we have in the paper and also in, in past um, papers as well. Um, so today, and in this short time, I'm just going to talk about the PMTs, proxy means tests, which are used to, to, to assess whether households are eligible or not to, to, to receive um, benefits from, from poverty targeted programs. So um, just, just a quick definition, what are PMTs? It's been described or it's been stated as, as PMTs are, are PMTs they, they describe a, a situation where information on household or individual characteristics correlated with welfare levels is used 
in a formal algorithm to proxy household income, welfare, or needs. This is taken from, from Grosch and Baker in 90, 1994, 1995. And I think it's when the term started to be coined or when, when, when it became more notorious. Um, it's what PMTs, I think, started in the 80s. The use of PMTs, in, in my understanding, is that it started in Chile. And the idea is that in many developing countries, in many low income countries, low and middle income countries, we don't have information or accurate information about uh, one's level of welfare, one's level of income. Um, because one, it's uh, people are not are not necessarily in the formal market, so their, their incomes are not necessarily assessed or, or uh, are not taxed. So governments and 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 wouldn't wouldn't be able to or are not able to 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 know people's um, income. Um, so one one way around it, and and which is what's become prominent in poverty target programs, is to use um, other household characteristics or, or observable characteristics of households and individuals to proxy um, one's level of income or, or welfare. Um, now. Just briefly, how how it's usually undertaken. So there, there are usually there are five steps in 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 the PMT process in in in, in acquiring or in formulating a PMT um, in any given program. First, you need to start with a with established household survey data set. So um, you then you need to identify what the latest nationally representative household survey, so which will have information about households key uh, and important information about households um, which are observable obviously so talking about demographics um, livelihood um, livestock um, and, and other types of assets that they own housing conditions and, and whatnot these are characteristics these are variables which we can then correlate with welfare right so the more you have of assets it presumably the more the, the richer you are the higher your level of welfare is so once you have that data set, once you have those characteristics, those variables in the data set in which you can correlate with welfare, you then run some statistical or econometric model to, to, to calibrate and, and to fine tune um, these variables and uh, with, with welfare. So trying to um, estimate what, uh, how, how these um, variables correlate with welfare. Um, so this is, you essentially you are training your model, your PMT model, with the household survey, and trying to adjust and make sure that the best you 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 produce the best model. And once once that's done, once you've selected the best model, you have then a selection of the observable and the chosen proxies in, in which uh, you will use to assess um, households um, based on those characteristics. Um, a key, a key aspect of this is when, when selecting a model is that obviously the more you put in, the more variables you consider, the more, um, the, the better, well, generally the better predictive power the model will have. Um, however, in managing such long list of, of, of proxies in, in, in practice, it's not, it's not really, um, it's not really practical. So there's usually a trade-off in, in this, in this, selection of model where, where one has to choose a manageable size of proxies, but knowing that you probably lose in your predictive power um, of the where well, you, you lose the model's predictive power in in in, in um, estimating consumption or, or or some other measure of welfare. And then once you've done the modeling, once you've decided the, the, the variables and once you've got all the estimates, you then apply another household survey, which only well, usually to save money and, and to save time, it will only consist of the, of the variables of interest so that you can then score households based on, on, on those. So that's usually the process it takes. Um, in the, but we know that from the start, from, from the beginning, we already know, we already um, fine whenever we, we, we apply a PMT, we're already fine that knowing that we won't have perfect prediction. So we already know there will be some uh, what, what we call inbuilt design errors. And once we, in, in looking at these inbuilt design errors, we've, we've tried to simulate some PMTs across a number of countries. And I've just realized 
not all, not all the names of the countries are, are, are listed in the label, my bad. But um, here in blue, we have Bangladesh, orange, Uganda, Nepal in green, and then, I um, can't remember now, sorry, I, won't, I won't, won't get to that. But we have three other countries that we looked at, um, I think Kenya, um, Pakistan, and, and Sri Lanka. But um, when, when looking at simulating um, what would be the, 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 the efficacy of, of PMTs in, in, in targeting, let's say, the poorest 10%, the 20%, or the 30%, the poorest in, 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 these, in these countries, we find that the targeting errors, and this is looking at the same household survey, which we train the model, we find that the targeting errors are, are, are quite outstanding. And, and, and remain very large, fairly large. And these are predictive models with reasonably high predictive power. Um, but we can still already see that given a trained model in the same household survey, we will still obtain fairly large house um, exclusion errors, inclusion and exclusion errors. And that we know that as the higher the coverage, the lower the, the, the targeting errors. Um, just to exemplify how, how, how poorly and, and, and bad these models can be, this is another case where we're looking at Bangladesh. Um, and here we're going to map all household observed in, 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 the, in the data set. Um, and we're going to rank them from left to right. We're ranking them from the poorest and richest based on the PMT model. So based on the score which the PMT produces. So the Closer you are to the to the left axis, um, to, to, to the left, the, the poorer you are based on the PMT model. The closer you are to the right or to the to the end of the, the graph on the right, the richer you are. And, and looking from bottom to top, we are looking at the actual observed um, level of consumption or level of welfare. So the not by the PMT standard, but rather than what is reported in the data set, the, 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 the closer you are to the bottom, the poorer you are. So that's your actual poverty or, or your, your actual level of welfare. And at the, the closer you are to the top, the richer you are based on the observed um, captured um, level of welfare. And so if the PMT were to be perfect in its predicting, in, 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 in predicting welfare, um, we should, in, in, in graphing this, we should find that all households should line up in a 45% degree line. Um, 45 degree line, sorry. So that um, if you are ranked in the bottom 20, if you rank 20 in, in as per the PMT, you should also be ranked 20 in the in as per the your actual level of welfare. But in fact, this is how it looks like in in a in a in a PMT that is that has been trained in the same household survey and it's got a decent predictive power when we look at the goodness of fit and other statistics. This is how it looks like. Um, each dot here represents a household, and we can see that uh, while generally the mass or, or, or households are generally lined up in the 45% uh, in the 45 degree line, there are quite a lot of variations or there, there are quite a lot of um, discrepancies. So um, we can see that on the top left corner, these are really rich, wealthy households as observed in the levels of consumption. In fact, when we use the PMT, they actually score poorly. And on the other hand, we can see very or highly um, rich off as per the PMT households on the on the bottom right corner of this of this graph. These households, in fact, are very poor. So if if a, if a program is targeting the bottom twenty percent, uh, we can see and, and and we can put a line on the on the on the twentieth percentile of the ranking of PMT. We should see that ideally we'd, we'd want everybody with the poorest 20% to be, uh, to be to the left of this. But what we see is that, in fact, quite a lot of people are, are, are to the right still and, and, and still below the 20th percentile. So, um, so anyone who's above the 20th percentile on the horizontal line, that's and and to the left of the 20th percentile in the in the PMT line, a vertical line, that's what we call the exclusion errors. And anyone to the 
right of the vertical line on the 20th percentile and to the bottom of the horizontal 20th percentile line is the exclusion area. So all these dots on the on the bottom of, and to the right of the graph um, are people who should have been targeted by the PMT but are not targeted by, 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 by the program if they're covering the bottom 20%. And the on everybody that's in the bottom left square there, those are the correctly corrected, those are the correctly targeted households. So just just also to exemplify how 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 PMT are not effective in targeting or, or how they can quickly become outdated. So despite not being able from the start, from after being trained in the same household, not being able to accurately target everybody. That we as spoken by Stephen, they can quickly become outdated. So we use date, two data sets from Rwanda, a panel data set. So we're observing the same households in two different waves. So in the first wave, we 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 trained the PMT and and we 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 collected the scores based on that first wave. And that's why we see, despite having some some fairly um, very varied spots across the graph, we do still 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 see a good mass around the 45 degree line. Um, but when we take that two years later or three years later in the, in the second wave of the, of the, of the panel of the, of, the, of the survey, we see a, a picture that, that's, that's completely across the board. So basically nothing is working here and, 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 and the lottery is just as good. Um, and so just to pencil out a few cases. So if you see the, the orange dot on the, first, on, the, on the first graph, which is on the top, top right corner, meaning that this household is both ranked as rich as per the PMT and is in fact rich, bec um, becomes in, in the second wave, applying the same scores, he becomes a poor household. Oh, the, this, this household now becomes poor as per the PMT, but remains rich as per the, his observed uh, level of welfare. Another household, which is deemed poor, both by its observed consumption level and by the PMT is now uh, somewhat richer as per the PMT three years later, but still remains in the bottom 40% of, of households. So there's, as you can see, even after three years, the scores attributed um, that, that come out from the PMT can become quite outdated. And, and this is in part explained by the difference, by, 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 by by how dynamic households are in terms of key characteristics using the PMT. So in fact, household size, for instance, is a key variable in PMTs. As we can see in, in Rwanda, household size is somewhat different um, from year to year. Um, and that's not necessarily captured in PMT. Now, I'm just gonna, if I have time, I'm gonna go through some five um, examples uh, of so five types of programs which use PMTs. And, and you will and have to do this quickly. Okay, mm. we'll do. So in a similar style here, we are, this graph is gonna demonstrate the accuracy of five different programs that apply PMTs across the world. And these are captured by household service. So these are, we're not testing the model itself, we're testing its effectiveness in targeting in practice, in, almost in practice, because we're looking at how it's been, um, we're looking at the household survey coverage of these programs. So it's, um, it's, it's the targeting areas that's captured by the household service. So Peru's Juntos program is, is probably the best in terms of the PMT. And here we have an exclusion area of 46%. So the program is targeting around, um, let's say 15% of households and it's correctly selecting 54% of them. And 46% are excluded incorrectly and, and therefore 46% are included ex um, correctly. So this is, this, is a, this is looking at households with children under 18, which is the, the eligibility criteria for Juntos program at the time of the survey at least. Um, we spoke about Pantawi, the four Ps program in, in the Philippines. So this at the time of the survey program was capturing, covering just over 20%, 22 so percent. And the exclusion error, the targeting error was found to be 48%. Um, another example, still considered on the good side um, relative to the other PMT programs is Pakistan BIS program where the exclusion error was 73, 73%. So we can start seeing higher numbers. Obviously, at the time of the survey, this was covering just over, just short of 10%. Um, Indonesia's PKH, the exclusion errors, 
the targeting errors is 82% as captured by, by Susanas. Uh, Guatemala's Mi Bono Seguro program, here we, we have one of the worst cases, it's 96%, that's the targeting error. So among the poorest, uh, eight or 7% that it's covered by the program, 96% are not in the program, which is very unfortunate. So just to summarize here, some of the causes of the inaccuracies in the, in the PMTs. Um, the proxies are, are relatively weak explanations of con consumption. So the predictive power, the goodness of, of fit of these models usually fall between 0.3 to 0.6%. So um, the higher you have this, the, the closer you are to one, the more the model can predict the variation of income or welfare. But here we can say that the model on average will only predict 50% of the variations in, 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 in consumption across households. Um, the PMT, it's a simple approach. It does not necessarily measure quality of assets, right? And, and, and sometimes not even the number. Um, yeah, proxies can reflect your past income, not your present income. So your assets that it's been assessed by the PMT might not reflect your income today, but rather when you, two years ago, that's when you were richer, you bought all these livestock or you, or you improved your housing condition. But today you're not in that situation, but still you're living off from, from that past where you were richer and you have better housing conditions and you have more assets. PMTs do not capture that. Um, and as mentioned extensively by Stephen, targeting is usually done by every five, 10 years, which is usually when nationally representative household of income and expenditure household surveys are done in, in, in most countries, right? Um, and um, also used, although it's used in favor of PMTs in such that PMTs are better than, than just simple income testing, such uh, because income testing, people can lie about their incomes. People can also lie about their assets and, and, and their housing conditions, right? Or, or even hide them if they're being observed by the numerators. Uh, and then there, there, there are also key main household surveys and unusual surveys, they have errors in them. Um, not, every, not everything is captured correctly. Um, just, a, just one example in, in Indonesia, when, when looking back at the cells that have been, um, that, that were being filled out by numerators, on average, about 15% of the cells were, were in, in, in the PMT scorecards were incorrect. And then just to finalize a few quotes from, from qualitative work in both Mexico and Kenya about people's perception about um, PMTs. In Mexico, one, one stated, what I understand is that when people ask me why they're not in the list, despite being surveyed, I tell them that I don't know the precise reason, but that probably it was a lottery. And because it was a lottery, no one knows who needs it most. In Kenya, God, um, one state is God, luck, or the computer, and it's beyond our understanding. So people don't really understand the PMT, but but um, and, and and do not think it's 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 fair. Thank you. Sorry for for the rush at the end. Thank you so much uh, for taking us then through this uh, nitty gritty of what's behind the PMT and and also some voices about the how it's perceived. Um, now we will open up for uh, Q&A and I can see that Emma and Stephen have been very active on, in responding to several questions uh, in writing. I can see uh, that um, uh, several of you have uh, been thinking about, okay, if there are problems with the social registry, then how can we respond to the dynamics of reality? Uh, so I would like to pick up on uh, the question by Jean Caric. Uh, if not through social registries, then how to target evolving vulnerabilities? What are the recommended approaches and methods? And I think uh, maybe Stephen would start on that and, and Emma could chip in as well. Um, are you there, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, th I think the question, it's almost like the, the, the question almost posing the, the problem is the assumption that we should do this. I mean, most effective social security systems in the world are universal systems, right? They've already moved away from this 19th century model where we're just going to target the very, very poorest into building comprehensive universal systems that are very effective then enriching the poorest members of, uh, of society uh, with, with very limited 
um, exclusion errors. Um, so if we really want to reach the, the most vulnerable members of society, you have to have a universal program because that's very effective in reaching. And it's important, I think, to distinguish between reaching the, the poorest members of society and targeting the poorest members of society. Reaching them is our objective, that's what we wanna do. Targeting them is just a methodology to which is not a very effective methodology in, in doing it. So, you know, it's uh, if we really want to, to reach the most vulnerable, then a universal system is the best way to, to, to do that. And it's also a popular system, you know, people will pay their taxes to, to invest in that. But they're often in most low and middle income countries not given that option because countries are still just building on this kind of 19th century poor relief system rather than shifting the paradigm to something much more modern and, uh, and, and effective. And in the end, you know, the, the problem with proxy means tests is while they're expensive, they're still very, very cheap if you don't do them for every five, 10 years. Um, you're just not doing a very effective targeting mechanism. A good means test, you have to spend a lot of money on getting a good means test. So if you really want to do a good means test in a country, spend a lot of money. But that money could be spent on, on benefits or do a very poor quality, poor relief scheme using a social registry, spend very little money and you'll end up with a very ineffective result. It's interesting in South Africa, they use an affluence test try and exclude the richest because they recognize that 70, 80% of the population are still living in poverty. And an affluence test where you just self-declare your own income is the most effective targeting mechanism that we found in the world. And that was people just but telling how, the truth about their income was. Yeah, uh, but how then would a universal system help us respond to the dynamics? Uh, because several of the, of the questions concerned then one, well, as things change, as you have shown, what other means are there then to respond to those that people become well, more or sick or whatever? The, because you, you one with the universal. So if you could have it, say that we take the Panterwood program Emma was talking about, right? It's a poverty targeted program in in um, in in the Philippines, and it's not very effective. Responded dynamics. Most uh, about half the poorest um, children in the Philippines don't access. The, the, the program at all. Now compare that to a universal child benefit, right? Where actually in responding to the dynamics, you've already given every family a minimum benefit for, for the child. So you've already had a response before any shock hits, um, which you're helping them with adjusting to the cost. And if then a major covariate shock happens, this, happened, this is what Mongolia did, but it has very high coverage, it's very easy to respond, just increase the value of the transfer to kids and you reach every kid in the, in the country very effectively, a very easy response, very, very quickly. You've already got your data there on your management information system. And as Mongolia did, it's a very easy, very effective response and re response to these uh, dynamics that, that, that you have. And then the dynamics that you have over the life cycle, a life cycle system that's in place to respond to challenges from childhood to old age will then enable you to respond to those dynamics that you have as you move through the life cycle. Unemployment benefits can help you um, when, when, you, when you're unemployed, but you have a mix of different schemes that respond to different shocks and risks that you may face at any point in your, in your life cycle. But it's a paradigm shift in thinking from what is driven in most low and middle income countries. Emma, would you like to, to add something on that, on, on responsiveness to the changing realities? Well, <laughs> I am with Stephen about the universal, uh, you know, uh, provisioning. So yeah, I don't really have, <laughs> yeah, I mean, except that when you have universal, like everybody is assured of something. So whether there is a shock or not, you have something and every everybody is in it. So yeah, that, that's actually better than just, you know, being very restrictive with who can, who, who deserves to have this very little amount of, of money. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Another, uh, issue of concern it seems to be among the audience is um, or, or interest is the possibility of linking social register to like census databases and other registers and I go to a question by Justice Oguna and he writes uh, for sure initial investment in social registers is high 
But if we look long term, is that still true? Social registries can be linked to other existing databases, for instance, census databases, etc. An introduction of self registration could reduce costs of implementation. So social registries could be used for poverty targeting as well as to tool to support adaptive social protection. Um, so could you elaborate about the, the links between different types of registries? Um, I don't know if Diloas or Stephen who wants. Yeah, well, well I, can, I, can, I can answer. I mean, in theory, you can make those, those links, right? So you can link, um, to the uh, you know to to your um, 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 vital statistics database where you've got your, your your ID cards, but the fundamental problem is why would you want to even invest in the social registry at all? Because most of the data on that database is inaccurate, right? And it's it's not effective for the targeting. So your actual choice of doing it is is, is um. You know, it's not a good choice that you've made in the in the first place. You've spent a lot of money. You can make these links, but still, the vast majority of the data that you have is, after a short period of time, very very inaccurate. And even when you collect the data, it's often inaccurate. When they did the uh, um, a, a large scale um, proxy means test survey in Indonesia as part of their social social registry, even collecting on the survey itself. 15% of the cells were inaccurately entered, right? Just on that, they were inaccurately entered um, by, the, by the surveyors. So you've got poor quality data in a poor quality database, which is delivering poor quality programs. When you have the option of moving to something that is, um, the, the, that is much better. So you can link data, but you know why would you be investing in the social registry when in fact, invest in other databases and other registries like your ensuring every child has a birth certificate, every citizen has an identity a card, build an effective single registry to monitor your social security schemes, et cetera. That's where you should be putting your money um, rather than into these inaccurate social registries. Just to add, uh, even the income tax system in most of these countries, 70 to 90% of households in low income countries are not in the income tax system which would be the one that you get more accurate information about one's level of income. Well, the, sorry, the Philippines, just a quick, uh, yeah. The, the Philippines has attempted to have this national ID, but I don't know the extent of the data that's included in your, you know, when you are ID identified. Um, and it would be interesting because it's still being, you know, it's still being in the in, in, in process. It would be interesting to to know how they would treat or how they would link the the listahanan because if they're really they're really serious about just using one registry and with this id system then i don't know if i mean there is politics around listahanan as well there are constituencies around the listahanan so i'm not sure if it can easily be phased out with this id system so yeah Okay, but you mean that ideally you would have the ID system as the basis rather than Lista Hanna? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's one question also, I think, uh, and you've already responded to it, Dila, but I think it's interesting to, to, to pick it up. Um, the accuracy of PMT, could it, it be improved by using uh, AI technologies such as artificial, machine learning? Artificial intelligence, yeah. Um, and machine, they, 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 they can, they can be improved, but without accurate, accurate data, I don't think there'll be a single model which will be um, good. Um, you still have errors there and they will still have errors as well, even by the model itself. I don't, don't think we have a model which will predict 100%. Um, that's, that's, not, that's not feasible, that's, not, that's impossible. So if, if you're happy with already people being excluded, then you can, yeah, you can invest more in, in having better models in it. But it's, um, that's, I think there's, there's, we need to shift a little bit the paradigm in, in terms of, of, of if, if we're happy with people being excluded or, or not, right? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the problem is, you know, we were told, right, the proxy means test, even just a few years ago, we were told by the advocates it was accurate, right? That's what they told us. You can read, you see, they told us it was accurate. These static models where they're doing the survey, they said it's accurate. 100% accurate. We've got quotes from the advocates who were telling us that. 
Then we present the evidence and we show that they're completely inaccurate. So now they're changing and saying, hey, we've got advanced methods of on-demand registration and uh, dynamic registration and machine learning, and that's going to make it accurate. Well, they were wrong the first time. They're definitely wrong the second time, but they keep on pushing it. And why do they keep on pushing it? Well, there's a big industry behind social registries. There's big loans to be sold on, on this. Bangladesh, they were sold a loan of $88 million to build their social registry. It's never been used, right? Because the data took so long to collect is completely inaccurate. And so the Bangladesh government has never used it. That was $88 million loans that were thrown out of the window. That could have been spent on something a little better in Bangladesh than a database that is never, ever used. But there are strong incentives behind this because people are selling a product, right? Like they're selling you a second-hand car, an old second, and they're not telling you the truth about the second-hand car. And as soon as you get it out of the garage, where you put or the shop, the the shop where you bought the car, it breaks down. That's what you're buying out of, out of this. Is take a lot of care and to sort of believe in people when they tell you we can do all of these things. They can't, and they never have, and they can't provide the evidence to show that it actually works. Speaking about the um, uh, the World Bank uh, and and the. Uh, uh, social protection jobs compass that was released last week I um, noticed that there isn't a lot uh, in there about poverty targeting but there's more about social registries uh, would you say that social registry is uh, the new way of the World Bank to talk about it that they sort of not as explicit as before on this yes well I think you, you've just released a paper with us, right, on, on uh, can a leopard change its spots, right, which uh, is shown with the World Bank's thinking around this. The World Bank committed by accident to universal social protection in 2016. The head of the World Bank said, yeah, with the ILO, we, we are behind universal social protection. So the World Bank had to re reinterpret the term universal to mean to mean targeted. So we know that poverty targeting is getting a bad name, the term, people don't like it. Everybody's saying, even the World Bank, universal social protection. So social registry sounds like a much nicer term, right? Just doesn't sound quite as quite as bad as, 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 as targeting the, the poorest, but it's the same thing, but it's just a better way of explaining the same old, same old um, way of, in, in which they've um, uh, been doing it for, for many, many years years and it will continue to fail. Now we are coming to close and I would like to put on the last question for you as an audience uh, to respond. I hope you can do that at the last minute, which is really about, you have, as you have noticed, um, the speakers here are very critical about the use of social registries. So what do you think? Is this critique correct? And your um, options to to uh, respond is absolutely yes yes maybe no or absolutely not so please respond to that and uh, as a final comment to, i would like to to actually respond to uh, a question about specifically this about the the world bank and and the question is how to engage them effectively to to transition towards universal social programs and actually uh, as a cliffhanger, I will uh, say that Stephen and, uh, and Development Pathways and Actuate of Sweden are actually working on such a paper on about how to talk about these issues and how to, to discuss them and to approach that. So that would be uh, the, uh, the, the theme for, for a future webinar somewhere in some space. But thank you so much much to all the speakers thank you for socialprotection.org and thank you to all the um all participants and thank you for um for being so active and and sorry for not having picked up all the the questions as uh but i hope you did with it in, in writing at least so thank you very much everybody and have a good evening or morning or day or whatever you are goodbye Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You didn't read out the results Bye. of the poll. It did not, but it was good, was it? Yeah. yeah.
<laughs> I'm, I'm happy I, I didn't forget about it totally. <laughs>